How many people do we have from the acres on the fence? Um, right now, it's we've got David, Patrick, Nancy, and I think that's it at the moment. So I'm just looking at the list and seeing, and I might have here at email folks just to see if they're having trouble. Um, so let me just okay. write that list down and uh, we'll see if we can get them on. Now, yeah, I see more people now. <laughs> I didn't realize I didn't see everybody on the bottom of my screen. I'm like, I had to scroll over. You'd think we'd all be experts at this by now, but <laughs> WebEx no. has a way of, uh, yeah, WebEx yeah. is actually, they, they roll out features, I think, every couple weeks and change the layout and change the, yeah, I see other people coming on. So. Yeah, we just, Edith and I think Keith just joined, so that's better. So, so. Yes, Jenny, Robert, and Sarah. Jenny's my alternate, so. Okay, so she's not probably, okay. Yeah. And is Robert somebody who's alternate too, is that correct? You remember? I Another don't word. remember. Edith probably okay. knows. Um. I don't remember offhand either. I, I can't recall now. I think he might be one of the alternates, yes. Okay, we'll just give it two more minutes, see if we can get another person or two on the on the line and then we'll um we'll get going. I am enjoying the background there, Edith. You have your Christmas tree up already? <laughs> it's only a week till. <laughs> Hi, I do, I do. How are you? Oh, I'm good. My background is here and my book deadline was yesterday, so <laughs> the paper is all over my house. You know, in a bit of holiday spirit, we went out last weekend and got a tree, and I have to tell you, it has scoliosis, so don't look too closely. It's like fitting to 2020. It's just a little anemic, but. That's the best tree, the ones that aren't perfect looking. <laughs> Hello, everyone. I wanted a noble fir, but my kids wouldn't let me get one. That's one of those ones that's like, it's got a stalk, and it's got like a branch here and a branch here. You know, they're, they, they called them Charlie Brown trees. They wouldn't let me get one, so. I have two trees this year. That's, uh, I had a one that was just a light bulb tree. There was no no leaves or anything. It was very modern, and that's the one I had for years. And then I finally decided to get a. I got a fake tree that looks like a real tree, but it's a narrow tree because these houses, you, as you know, are not large enough for a full size tree. So I got a very narrow, tall tree this year. We got one a handful of years ago out in Middleburg at a chop your own tree place, and. I can't recall what kind it was. It had a lemony citrus flavor uh, smell to it, and it was very narrow, but still really full. It was the most glorious tree. My kids would argue with me because they like the big fat conical <laughs> ones, but, um, and I cannot recall, uh, I cannot recall what kind it was, but I haven't ever found another one like that since. So anyway. All right. That's very, very <laughs> festive all the same. Yeah. All right, well, thanks everybody for coming. Um, we're just going to get started. I sent an email um, to the four folks. There might have been one person I know that couldn't make it, um, but I know that um, RV Das had trouble last time. So I just want to make sure if they're trying to get in that um, hopefully if Kira can help them get in, we can get everybody in. Like I said, something's been going on with WebEx. I know that they've shifted over to a, a new platform and it seems that there's been some, some interesting hiccups for people. Um, and I will warn you that my computer today um, I think by like 10 o'clock, I've restarted seven times because um, it just kept kicking me out of everything and nothing was working. So if that happens, Kira is ready to forge on and I will try to log back in either with this computer or another one. So just a heads up, it's that kind of day, I guess. Um, so first off, um, I'd like to introduce um, Sue. And so I'm not sure how to say Kovac Schumann, is that correct? Kovac. Kovac Schumann. Um, so Hello, Sue everyone. is is another member of the History Commission um, who's going to join our group. Um, she is one of the newest members. Um, the previous person for the Providence District had uh, uh, resigned from the board. And so Sue offered, though, to join up. And um, sorry, I have a 
four and a half year old thing on a window um, to join uh, the group and uh, help us with her, you know, join us with her expertise of um, being on the history commission and just the, her local history knowledge. So, so if you just want to give us a little introduction about yourself, that would be great. Well, other than what you just said, um, I have my background, my professional training is decades as a journalist. And I worked at the Washington Post for 20 years. I've done a lot of writing and editing. And um, the History Commission thing, I've been writing a lot about history over the years. So I have a certificate in public history and history of preservation from NOVA uh, for the last few years. And I'm trying to use that public history part and get more community people interested in our wonderful area. And I'm delighted to be on the History Commission. It's been fun so far. Thank you all. Thanks for letting me join. Well, thank you for having us. Um, Kira, I just sent you an email if you could follow up on that. that would be great. Okay, so we are gonna get going. Um, it's kind of, a, I mean, it's a brief agenda, but a lot on it kind of to get through as usual. So um, even though there's only really two topics, um, it probably will take us uh, two full hours unless we just plow through. Um, so the first thing we wanna talk about is just kind of the beginning, to talk about to discuss um, the design guidelines. We've talked a, a bit about them and, and how they are versus what goes into the zoning ordinance. Um, but since the Holland Hills work group is a bit ahead of us, um, they are at the point now where they have, uh, they've been working on draft design guidelines. Um, and so Elise had mentioned it might be good to bring those here so you guys could kind of see them and get a sense of what they could look like for Holmes Run Acres HOD. Obviously, they're very specific to Holland Hills, but there are definitely some good comparisons um, just because of the mid century architecture. Um, and I think it'll give us a good idea about, um, and I think we've been doing a good job about thinking what would go in the design guidelines in our discussions. Um, but I think this will also give you a sense of how they'll be used and what they will look like. Um, and just in general, like as we go forward, how the ARB will use them. So I'm going to bring up them, the Holland Hills. and. Just remember, these are draft, um, so what you see in them may change. Um, I have been really involved with the design guidelines um, lately, so Elise can probably give us some information if you need them. But again, they're draft, so they will change uh, between now and whenever they are finalized, assuming that Holland Hills uh, passes and becomes an HOD. So just keep that in mind um, as we go forward. Well, this is going to be fun. Not giving me a share screen. Oh, this one. Okay. Okay, there we go. Okay. So, and uh, just let me know if you have any questions. I'm just going to kind of go over briefly because, as you can see, it's 114 pages. Um, I will send you guys a link to this tomorrow for the share file, and then that way you can peruse through it at your nature. Um, we are just awarded the contract for uh, somebody to work on the design guidelines for Homes Run Acres, which is great. Um, and I'm hoping to have them on board by the end of this year, which means if possible, we'll have them come to our January meeting. So that way you guys will talk about an introductory to the design guidelines right now. You guys can look over what they've done so far for Holland Hills, and then we can have a really good conversation, hopefully, with the contractor um, in January to kind of get that ball rolling. Um, so, let's scroll through this. Um, so, just briefly, so some of the stuff I'm probably just going to skip over is kind of the introduction to the design guidelines and history and significance, um, just because that will be similar in yours. Um, it will just be explaining the design guidelines. And obviously the history and significance of Holmes Run Acres versus Holland Hills. Um, hold on one second. There you go. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, oh, let's skip a whole bunch. Oh, I have this new keyboard that if I lean on the right side of it, it hit, hit, hit hits enter a bunch of times and I end up on a whole different page. <laughs> okay. Um, and then they've got the preservation basics and planning a project in, oh, it switched up. Okay. Um, and so then it will go into the historic overlay district overview. So it'll show, you know, the overview of Holmes Run Acres, what we determined to be the HOD boundary, which we're still not 
that point of talking about yet, but probably will in January. Um, contributing non-contributing resources, which we've been doing a lot of, and then kind of a summary of the district character, also what we've discussed a lot in the first few meetings. But the big part, and I think which will be the most um, illuminating, is the district specific guidelines. So I'm going to jump down to those. Um, page okay. Um, and so this is where it gets into, like it says, the specifics for Holland Hills. Um, and so that's a lot of what will come out of from the National Register nomination, from the work that we've done at the county. And then, of course, from the work that we're talking about in the work group, kind of the information that you guys have given us and kind of the concerns and things that you think are important or not important or what what character defining features make up the neighborhood. Um, and you'll see that like this kind of sentence right here. Um, is you know, it's something that would be very similar, I think, to Homes Run Acres. It, you know, it strongly encourages preservation where possible, but also supports creative compatible changes that upholds the district's renowned modernist design legacy. So. Obviously, you know, I mean, that's that's kind of like the basics of the sort of preservation. They always want to preserve first where possible, but we also understand that you live in a in a house that you live in, right? So you need to be able to change it as necessary. Um, and so we don't want to make it um, difficult to live in a homes or neighbor's house. Um, and also has this handy chart of like what the guidelines do and what they don't do, um, which I think is important. And I think that's I think you guys have gotten a really good grasp on that so far. Um, we've talked about it a lot, but as we go out into the community, as we get to that point, this will be a really big conversation because I think that's where um, people get a little bit nervous about, you know, what is being regulated versus what is a guideline. And so, um, you know, it talks about it helps. I think the best thing too is that it provides objective criteria that Arabic can use to better protect and preserve unique and valuable historic resources. And I think that's a good thing because you know, the ARB makeup of, of who's on the ARB will change over time, but in theory, we will be giving them the same guidelines, right? So they have the same document to work from. And, you know, they have design guidelines for the districts now, but they are very old. They're actually uh, typed out on the typewriter. And so we're redoing all of them, which will be good and make them much more standardized around the county um, to the point until it's, it's got uh, district specific. So, um, and then obviously the guidelines, yeah, question. Yeah, just a quick question, Nicole. Um, mm -hmm. So, who who acts as the? Because we have a list of guidelines do and guidelines don't. Who's the mm -hmm. moderator that makes those determinations whether or not some you know we've crossed the line in some places? So who moderates that? Is that the county? Yeah, yeah, basically, I mean, it'll be in conversation with you guys. And also, I mean, like, um, obviously, there's certain things that we, if we go back to the zoning ordinance that we can and can't do. Um, but then if there's things that we want to make sure that we're talking about and getting people to do, and that's going to go in the guidelines that they can't go in the zoning ordinance. But there are some things specifically, right, like, under the don't, like, dictate that all historic buildings must remain as they were originally. Like, we don't have the ability, you know, like, to do that, and nor do we want to. Um, and so most of these will come from like, and then like regulate interior design. Like we just we zoning, like we don't have that in the zoning ordinance. They're, the state has not given the county the ability to regulate your interior design. Um, so that's kind of one of those things too. But I would imagine that most of these are fairly standard and will be very similar to what would go into a homeless or acres guidelines do and don't. Okay. So what they get into, so the Secretary of Interior Standards for Rehabilitation are generally what these guidelines will be based on, um, which is kind of a national standard. Um, this is what historic preservationists and historians use very often. And again, they're, they're standards, right? They're guidelines. Um, and so, it, so what comes from, what will end up in ours are kind of based off of this. And so certain things like the historic character of a property shall be retained and preserved. Um, the removal of historic materials or alteration of features and spaces that characterize property shall be avoided, right? So it's that kind of language where they shall be, but we can't require it. And that's where the ARB will come in to have those conversations about trying to trying to help a homeowner maybe avoid that. And if not, how can we make it so it fits into the character of the neighborhood? Okay, so um so for the Holland Hills, and this again will probably be similar, there may be some different 
building elements and features uh, for homes run acres when we get to that point. So basically what happens now is in the guidelines, they'll go through each of these features and they'll talk about what's recommended and what's not recommended. And they generally have pictures to go with it. So I think it helps, you know, with the illustrious. So you can see things you can, you know, it's, it's hard when somebody says, well, just don't use this material. And you're like, well, what else should I do? And then you can see different things. So for example, we've got guidelines for foundations. Um, and, you know, it starts out, you know, retain, preserve, and repair existing concrete or brick foundation and, you know, ensure water flows away. And these are, you know, generally recommended for most foundations, right? Um, but they're just making sure that it's very specific so that you're seeing it. You're like, okay, this is what I want to do. And then when you get the not recommended or what we'd call an inappropriate treatment, non-original materials such as stone or wood, replacement foundations that visually contrast or compete with the walls above or altering the original height of the foundation. Um, then we got walls and exterior cladding. Um, and so they talk about a little bit, and you guys will have something similar because you guys have very similar, um, well, I should say within your neighborhood, you have very, you know, uh, oftentimes the siding choice is very similar from structure to structure. Um, so it talks about what's existing in the neighborhood and then they'll talk about what's recommended. So obviously the first one is to, to try to keep it in the best shape possible. We all know that's not always possible, especially maybe if you come in and you just buy the house in the neighborhood. Um, and so then it's talking about if necessary, how to repair or replace the structure of the cladding. Um, and so it's talking about replacing sections of the wood members rather than the entire element. Um, if we go to repair brick masonry by repointing with new mortar that replicates the old in color texture and pointing uh, technique and doing spot repair. Um, and so again, the not recommended, I think is also where it'll give you a little bit more detail. So like newer substitute, uh, substitute materials were not originally present, such as vinyl or aluminum. Um, and I think we've touched on that a little bit in some of the structures that we've looked at. Um, and we, you guys have seen right away, like which which replacement materials work and which ones don't. Um, I think one of the best ones. So yeah, so then they've got some pictures of the different types of um, vertical wood cladding and the used brick cladding that they use there. Same there. And so like these are all the recommended treatments, um, most of which are original, but. Um, I think this right now the section that helps, I think, is the best visually for me and to explain is this one with the roof, roof features and roof materials. And I think will also help kind of um, touch on what we've talked about, whether it's specific to homes or an acres or kind of a mid century feel. Um, so they talk about the different uh, different types of roof shapes in Holland Hill. So obviously, you know, they recommend the original flat or low slope roof forms, maintain the shape structure gable, butterfly, or shed, um, and then they get down to, they show the different types of the roof forms, and then obviously the not recommended, um, altering the roof shape, um, removing the original chimneys, um, installing gutters that are prominently visible. It doesn't mean you can't install gutters, but there are definitely ways to do it. Um, and then they have this, which I think is super helpful for roofs and will probably have for other other parts of the, the guidelines. So kind of like we we're talking about the mid-century, like these are all, except for, I don't think there's any of those with the cupola in Holmes and Acres, but you guys all have, or are there any flat roofs too? But um, there's different types of gable roofs, shed roofs, um, sometimes with additions, uh, some of the structures have formed kind of like a butterfly roof, which, you know, and then the not recommended, you know, um, some of these are fairly obvious, like a mansard roof um, or a gambrel roof. Those would seem very strange in uh, homes or acres. And so I think this kind of um, visual is very helpful and uh, also makes it very specific too. Like, it, you know, if you're going, you want to change your roof, like maybe you um, are having a lot of leakage problems and you want to change your roof. Um, hopefully this can help you get to a place where you can get a roof that works for the character of the neighborhood um while also fixing the problem so you don't end up putting like a giant a-frame roof in for some reason I think that's the best way to solve your problem um obviously entrances porches and decks um so they talk about that too again they start off with kind of retain a original entry doors porches and decks maintenance is a big thing um and then they kind of show the different ones about what's like so this one like the primary entrance is flush um and elevated above the ground, the fully glazed door, so just the fully glass door. And then 
you can see the sliding glass doors that open to the rear. Um, and then not recommended, obviously, is how they change them. And so you can see the non-original front door with molded details is not recommended. Again, doesn't mean that you couldn't do that, but if somebody came in and they were putting on that new entrance, um, the A or B would be like, well, instead of that door, can we find a different door? Obviously, they can't tell you what, what door product to buy, but they would ask like, hey, maybe we can find a different design that will fit better with the new one. Um, and then windows, obviously, same thing will happen with uh, looking at homes or acres is how the windows interact. And we've talked a bit about that kind of um, how they interact with the walls, um, where they're located on the structure, how do, how do replacements fit into the into the neighborhood? And obviously, you can see, too, in Holland Hills, some of these structures are, you know, as you know, just full walls of windows. Um, and so not recommended. Um, basically how you're you know you're going to change the how the window is seen like new penetration so putting in new windows where maybe there wasn't one before um replacement windows that aren't consistent with the modernist aesthetic of uh, the hod um and changing the design and operability of the windows especially when they're visible so those are different things that we can talk about so the example they have here is just you know holland hills originally had them very narrow thin frame which you could see up on on this house and this house. But then you get down here and you can tell very much that that's a replacement window. Um, and then they also get into the details and ornamentation, which might be similar for homes right acres because of that mid century modern architecture style. Um, they had a lot of privacy screens and fences. Well, they have some fences, um, which is a big discussion for them too. Um, and then they get into mechanical systems and plumbing and again, obviously just recommendations. And the goal is to try to recommend continued maintenance as best you can. But again, aging systems sometimes are difficult, especially from that period. Um, but the recommendations, you know, are placing new systems in, you know, in more inconspicuous places. So you're not putting the new um, AC unit right in front, um, which I don't think most people would do anyway, but sometimes it's, it makes sense for some reason. Um, and we probably will have a discussion too about garages, carports, and non-attached structures. Um, obviously for um, Holland Hills, the garage, new garages aren't recommended because they were not an original feature of Holland Hills where homes were makers. Obviously there were a number, well, obviously there were a number of carports and then also a number of houses that had garages. They also recommend not including an original carport, but I think that would be different for homes or makers because, because I think we've seen that as one of the earliest um, changes that happen and also one of the ones that kind of fits the neighborhood most. So that would be something that might be very different for, for homes for neighbors. Um, and also they have a health safety and accessibility um, section. So again, you know, obviously if you're going to age in place in your home, you might need to install a wheelchair ramp. And so obviously that is something you can do. Um, being a historic district does not mean you can't do that, but it's, you know, they're going to try to ask you to do it in a way that hopefully it minimizes the, the change, the visual change on it. Um, and also sustainability, because we also know that's an issue, um, especially for mid-century homes. Uh, and so they give recommendations of ways to help make your home more um, energy efficient. And also, you know, so if you do want to put on um, panels uh, for sun, that's a possibility, but how you do it, solar panels, um, assuming that it's fine for the zoning ordinance. I can't remember who lives in China if I'm wrong there. Um, but they make recommendations about where to put them and how it should work. Um, so that way, yeah, as we move into the future, and if you do want to make your home more energy efficient, that you have the ability to do. And then eventually they'll have um, preventative and uh, cyclical maintenance checklist. Um, it's not in there now, but hopefully that's just a helpful thing. Um, in the future for everybody. Uh, and then, so this will be for new construction and new additions. Um, and so this will obviously be more dependent on um, specific to homes or acres, because uh, obviously there's, they have some similar siting issues and concerns um, that we do, but um, so like designing new construction additions to be set back from the street, um, and that kind of stuff. And I think I just saw a question. Sorry, it's hard for me to see this. Um, okay. Yes. 
um, yes, I, tomorrow I'll send you guys a link uh, to give you a copy of these draft guidelines. And I was just saying in the beginning to just remember that they're they're very draft, but I do want you guys to like have a chance to look through them to get an idea. Um, so that way, when we meet with the um, the contractor, hopefully in January, we can have a really good educated conversation about um, what you may want to see in the design guidelines and what may need to be different for homes or makers. Um, and so this would be also too maybe where we talk about um, you know how the roads work or lighting works um, or um, lack of sidewalks um, that kind of stuff size scale and massing which is obviously has been probably one of the bigger conversations for homes or acres um, so depending on what or how much we put in the zoning ordinance if we do about size um, or setbacks um, the rest will end up here if depending on our concerns um, and so you can see the different ways, new additions that are deferential in character, meaning they're modest, subordinate, allow the original house building to communicate its primacy. Um, they're sensitively attached to the original building volume, set back from the primary plane. Um, and this was a conversation that I think um, they had in Holland Hills because, and I think we've touched on a little bit here too, is that a lot of times people don't want that to be very obvious that it's an addition. Um, traditionally in historic preservation, um, that's kind of been one of the key components is that you you don't want to make it very obvious that it's an addition, but you don't want to pretend that it's part of the original building. Like you don't want to recreate history by adding this on and making it look like the structure always looked like that. Um, but that's a, a long, we can have more discussion about that as we go. Um, so yeah, and then they've got the not recommended. Um, New constructions or additions that cover much of the lot, which is likely not allowable by code. Um, ones that uh, new construction or additions that require extensive disturbance or of the surrounding landscape or mature trees, which I think will also be a concern that you guys will have too. We've talked a little bit about that, especially last week. Um, yeah, so, and then proportion and symmetry. Um, which we'll talk about too, because I think you guys, you have kind of asymmetrical um, structures for the most part. And then um, they get into building elements and features. So, um, yeah. Okay. So, um, all right, one second. Um, um i think lily might be able to answer lily I, can you see that question yeah um, did holland hill spend any time anticipating the fallout the rippling effect of what is being proposed in zmod i'm really concerned lily did you hear that Um, I don't know off the top of my head, Elise might be able to, oh, yeah, let me see if I can, sorry. I gotta stop sharing it first. Oh, is that you? Fully there? This is Elise. ZMOD really did not come at, up at all at Holland Hills. I mean, if I can just interject, I think um, maybe, uh, you know, they started the process before ZMOD kind of hit the the public domain, but I think that um, we have to, and bankers look at this because we do not have uh, any guidelines currently. We have no covenants, and we are not a homeowners association. And the kind of things that are going to go from requiring a special permit to being by right um, really have the opportunity to change dramatically the way we experience this neighborhood, um, not least of which the ability to put an accessory unit inside every single one of our homes, um, a business inside each of the original dwelling and, the um, and then signage and extra cars and, you know, clients and traffic. And I just think that, you know, you suddenly start having the conversation about, well, now you have renters in every house so where do you put the secondary door um are we going to end up you know and that's all going to have an architectural component to it so i'm 
I'm really concerned about, I mean, I know that homeowners associations all of, across Fairfax County are scrambling to figure out what kind of um, protective measures they can put it right into their homeowners association, you know, guidelines or requirements or whatever they are, but those are binding. We don't have anything like that. So I guess my concern is we go through all this effort with the historic overlay district and then ZMOD comes in with its, you know, sweeping yay housing um, uh, mandate and how do we guard against that? You know, how do you, how do you guard against that? I mean, how, you know, how, if we're having this discussion, so, you know, things like fences and, and enclosing carports when, when you're now suddenly slapping extra entrances on things and entrances on things. And I don't know, I just, I, I, I feel like it's something that it's difficult to address because I'm sure that the ARB and um, the heritage resource staff, you know, you all probably haven't dealt with this before because this is new stuff being thrown at us. But, you know, the more I read into ZMOD, the, the more concerned I am about the survivability of the existing stable neighborhoods that we have. And so then how does putting, you know, um, guidelines into place that are somehow binding. How binding are they? Can they help to offset the damage that ZMOD's going to do? I, I, I have real questions about this. Um, your first question uh, regarding whether um, the ZMOD changes were uh, discussed at Holland Hills um, work group meetings. They have not been. Uh, we didn't have that discussion yet. It it was not brought up. Um, the reason being that um, you know one um, the the changes proposed in ZMOD, if approved, of course, um, would be uh, something that would be permitted um, administratively. The accessory dwelling unit. A certain type of accessory dwelling unit would be permitted administratively, and it would be within the existing footprint of the building. It's my understanding that's what is being proposed to be approved administratively. Anything beyond that, beyond um, the new limitations, would still be um, something that would have to be reviewed by the Board of Zoning Appeals like it is currently. Um, currently, accessory dwelling units are permitted, provided you meet certain requirements, and uh, it is approved by the Board of Zoning Appeals um, with a five-year permit. Um, however, um, because it's a change in use and not um, necessarily something that will change the footprint of the building unless you come in with an addition, um, it hasn't been discussed at the Holland Hills meeting, um, but I, I do understand your concerns. At this time, what is being proposed is a limited amount, a limited square footage, and I don't remember exactly how, how big it can be. It's a percentage, I believe, that could accommodate an uh, accessory dwelling unit within the existing footprint of the building and not a detached structure. Anything that's detached um, would not qualify in the uh, Holland Hills or um, the Holmes Acres uh, subdivision because it requires uh, a larger lot size to accommodate the um, detached structures. Un understood. I, I, uh, uh, I understand that it has to be an acre plus lot for a separate. I'm, I'm talking about every one of our houses right now, because we have an upstairs and a downstairs entrance, could have an accessory unit within our footprint. Correct. My concern is the minute you do that, uh, which means every single house in our in our neighborhood, the minute you do that, obviously you double the volume, which puts a tremendous amount of pressure on the neighborhood. Um, and you're going to start seeing people pop up, you know, little entrance ways and little things like that that don't necessarily fall within the strict parameters of existing square foot. They're all the little, those are all the little extras, the stoop here and the thing there. Those are all the little extra things we get to do in zoning that don't have to comply within the, you know, with, with that strict interpretation of within the existing footprint. And I think that that's going to 
for simple houses that have a, a mid-century modern design element to them. If you start putting all these little accretions here and there, um, it's going to dramatically change the look of these simple houses. So I'm just, I just don't understand. Um, well, I don't understand fundamentally how Fairfax County is pushing forward with this, especially for neighborhoods like ours, but I don't also understand where that leaves off and where a historic overlay district might be able to come in and and obviate the damage that that can do, I guess is the best way to put it. I, I will state emphatically, this is, ZMOD is, a, a, is really bad news for existing stable neighborhoods. Um, the changes in ZMOD um, would, would apply countywide at this time if they were approved. Again, it's still up to, um, the board and the planning commission, it hasn't gone through the public hearing process yet, but it is um, good to hear from you the concerns you have. And I would encourage everyone to reach out to the board and provide these comments. Um, I'm sure they are hearing from um, other communities as well. Um, I'm not aware that the Holland Hills community has reached out to their representatives at this point, but um, I think I, I may have sent to Nicole and she's forwarded to you the ZMOD team's uh, contact information as well so that this you know concern will be communicated um, but at this point it's being um, um, proposed and it's being considered um, um, countywide and it would be something that would be maybe approved and maybe not approved at the public hearings, but this would be a good time to reach out to the Board of Supervisors and provide your comments on and concerns on it. But in, in terms of adding additional restrictions on a proposed uh, HOD like this one, that would maybe um, not allow something that is not even um, approved at this time, I don't think would be applicable. Um, we would be looking at whether um, the creation of the HOD itself will, will be supported or not, but with additional limitations. Now, um, one thing we can look at is how, how if, let's say, accessory dwelling units were to be approved, how would it impact the new HOD and what kind of um, limitations or reviews would be required. Um, the underlying um, requirement that any building permit uh, would require a review by the architectural review uh, review board would, would still be there. So any additions to accommodate accessory dwelling units or even any structural changes will require a review by the um, ARB. That will look at preserving the HOD as a whole, but the use, the use itself and the intensity, that will not uh, be something the ARB will look at, like you said. So that is something that needs to be um, reviewed as part of the ZMOD adoption itself. So I would encourage everyone to go ahead and um, contact their um, representatives and, you know, have this concern be voiced, but I'm pretty sure they have already received additional comments on this. Yeah, and so in addition to what Lily was saying um, is, and I can't remember the timing of when it may be, is it the summer, Lily, when it may be? So it's I it's um, going to be heard uh, early spring. Okay. Um, we can forward the link to the website, which has the public hearing dates. I um, I know that the uh, ZMOD was recently authorized, so the Planning Commission and the Board of Supervisors public hearing dates are already published. Um, the um, uh, final authorization staff report has also been published. It's available on the website. Um, they're looking at a, a delayed effective date of uh, July, I believe, but the approval would come a couple of months earlier. Okay. I think March or April, April. Okay. Cause what I'll do is, um, in addition to what Lily recommended, um, I would, I'll look into 
what our options are for putting putting a discussion in either the design guideline, probably well, the design guidelines about like kind of what Lily was saying is like obviously if this is enacted, um, what recommendations do we make for um, accessory dwelling units? Like how do we if if ZMod passes and that's included, then how do we adjust um, the HOD to make sure that if people do want to put one in, how are the changes being made that keep the character of a neighborhood? Um, as Lily said, like if that's a Fairfax County wide thing, I, we can't change that for for the HOD. No, I think I think this gets to the whole um, question that I think Patrick's had before, and I have as well, which which is you've got zoning that dictates you know building envelope and density and you've got hod that dictates design guidelines and how much can one impact the other the issue with the zmod obviously it's countywide obviously they're they're looking to to basically urbanize fairfax county but the the issue is if you allow on our small lots that now have small homes that are dependent on the nature and the trees and the copious amount of land that we have if you now say eh, to heck with that we are allowing basically every single house and homes or acres to effectively be a duplex now for a developer our lots look a heck of a lot nicer you add that you add to that the fact that the hod can't and won't dictate how big an addition can be and i could say you know i'm 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 under 50% of where I could be in my allowable building envelope. So I theoretically, even within the confines of the historic overlay district, I think if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, could double the size of my house, rent out half of it. And now if everybody exercises the right to do this, you know, we end up with really not a lot of trees and not a lot of land left. Um, you're you're not going to see people interested in in keeping the aesthetic of the homes well, well, home so i'm just i'm i'm that's why i'm concerned about this i'm not concerned about you know patrick or keith or myself or anybody on this panel suddenly mcmansion on in our house within mid-century modern confines and whatever i i am concerned about because we can't empirically say you cannot tear down your house and build something four times the size. We can't. We can just say, if you build something four times the size, we want you to use shallow sloped roofs and that kind of thing. I, I just think ZMOD's gonna make our little corner of the world highly attractive to somebody who's gonna wanna push the envelope royally. And, and so I just, I am a little bit concerned, or not a little bit, a lot concerned about the amount of effort we're putting into this and that's why I was curious if Holland Hills has dealt with this um, because ZMOD has the, you know, by all accounts, it looks like it is going forward. It's being highly publicized by the county as a positive thing. And I, I just, I don't get, I don't get where we fit in. Um, I think again, like kind of what Lily said is like, obviously we, we can't control that. Um, but I think that you do need to reach out um, and I'm sure you probably have because you've obviously been involved with um, your supervisor's office um, before. But I think that's, you know, reach out to your supervisor and make sure that you're making the public comment. And, and you know, I think specifically bringing up Homes Run Acres. I mean, they know that we are engaged in this effort. Um, and, you know, I I don't I can't speak for the supervisor to say whether or not they want it to succeed or fail. But I, I would imagine that, you know, they don't put board motions forward if they think it's not a great idea. So, I mean, maybe they haven't come to that. They haven't thought about that issue. They haven't, you know, it, it hasn't been a concern for them. So it might be helpful to hear it from, from the homeowners themselves. Is it, I mean, it's going to affect, obviously, like you said, it'll affect you before it'll affect us, but. Um, I think it's one of, I think it's one of the things, I mean, I, I agree with Edith a hundred percent. The, the, First off, the devil's in the details when we were talking about, you know, what the guidelines are, but there's a bigger pressure on the neighborhood, which is caused, you know, caused by the the rezoning that is happening or that is up for consideration. And there doesn't seem to be any way to protect the neighborhood as we're going through this process 
it sounds like we could go through all of this and still not achieve what we want to. Um, because there are certain things we can't do. I mean, they're just they're they're illegal. I mean, at the bottom, at the end of the day, they're illegal. We can't change or overstep the bounds of a historic overlay district on what's allowable zoning. Um, and and I think Edith, I mean, maybe this is something you know we kind of take offline. But I agree with you that this is horrible for the neighborhood. Um, I think there's a lot of concerns that I've had with the historic overlay district and whether or not it would accomplish preventing some of the things from happening. As we continue to discuss these, you know, week after week, my understanding is, is that the mod and other things will not be prevented by a historic overlay district. And so um, I don't I don't know, you know, I'm not gonna come to a conclusion, but the the badness of what's happening with that doesn't consider there's no protection offered to a community that is going through this process because it's not going to stop. I mean, if it takes us two years, hypothetically, to mm -hmm. get through this, within two years, if ZMOD is passed, the impacts on this neighborhood, um, I can assure you, um, and I'll, I'll, I'll pick my words, you know, carefully, but this will definitely not be the same neighborhood. We, this is not a neighborhood characterized by you know, three and four families living in a single dwelling, you know, this was a, this was, these were single residential houses. And I don't think even a design implications of saying thou shall not have a separate, you know, or shouldn't have a separate main entrance is going to prevent that from happening or maintain the historical value of the neighborhood. So I think what Edith is trying to figure out is, you know, what is the, what is the overlap? What is, you know, where does this help us? Where does it not help us? And hypothetically, um, we all know we're not naive. The county can generate more tax revenue by allowing more uses within these houses. That's going to, you know, overtake any sort of, you know, if, if we can prove that a historic overlay district generates more revenue for the county, and therefore afford protection, that may outweigh ZMOD. But I think in general, th this is what happens with zoning. Zoning is, is, is generally set up to maximize the available tax base and everything for, you know, whether it's a county, whether it's a municipality, whatever. I mean, that's what it's done for. And so we have to figure out whether or not what we're doing is actually creating more benefit to the county than allowing this to happen. So, so I think, um, yeah, I think there's a couple of things. I mean, I think, um, uh, yes, there, I think there's definitely some concerns and I will do a little bit more research and I'll reach out specifically to our uh, ZMOD folks and see if we can have a discussion about that and see if there are ways that we can, as we're going through this process. Um, can we bring them on board to a meeting? I'd, I'd yeah, I mean, possibly. yeah, possibly. Um, I'm sure that they've been they've been on tour for I think the last few years, so I'm sure <laughs> another meeting would. Uh, um, so yeah, I'll reach out to yeah. them um, to see what we can do. Um, because you know, again, like Lily said, like we can't, you know, our process we can't control that. But um, but I will reach out to them and hopefully see. Yeah, maybe we get them to come to a meeting and see if there's a way that we can make it work. Um, and I think. Um, you know, there is also, you know, there's a dearth of affordable housing in the county right now. I think, you know, I can't speak to the whole issue of why they're doing everything they're doing, so I won't speculate. But, um, you know, and one way that preservationists have seen homes preserved that always is, is affordable housing, like preservation. I, I don't mean like uh, different, basically, oftentimes, you know, people demolish older houses just because, but if we can reuse them in, you know, and I know it's not your goal to make your neighborhood um, duplexes, but um, sometimes if it's a, a way to do it, to keep that the existing structure, obviously if they're knocking them all down then that's, it doesn't matter at all, but. Um, if, if, if I may clarify um, quickly, and then we can move on to the agenda on hand, but I wanted to clarify uh, two things. One is, that um, ZMOD basically um, what 
how it started is that our zoning ordinance, the current zoning ordinance is from 1978 and we have done um, multiple amendments throughout the years. It's, it's, over, it's been over 40 years now. And what ZMOD primarily does is update the zoning ordinance and change the format to make it more um, you know, user friendly and also um, updated to include or incorporate all the various uh, determinations and various amendments we've been working and adopting throughout the past 40 years. Um, in doing so, um, some some changes are proposed. So it's it's not all new. Most of it is just updates or tweaks to the existing zoning ordinance. But like like um, discussed here, the uh, ad accessory dwelling unit portion is going to be changed to allow certain accessory dwelling units to be permitted by right. But being a, an accessory structure, it still needs to be subordinate to the primary structure. So in, in this neighborhood and other residential single family neighborhoods, um, duplexes are not going to be permitted by right. Duplexes would be two structures that are more or less um, function the same way. So there are additional limitations to keep it as accessory in order to limit the impact. But I just wanted to clarify this, but like Nicole said, maybe the ZMOD group will, um, she will invite them and we'll have them for discussion so that we can have more information from them. And they've I'm pretty sure they have heard a lot from the community, so they may have better responses than what we can provide right now, but um, it will be something maybe we can discuss at a future meeting. But I just wanted to clarify that ZMOD, the intent of ZMOD was to update the zoning ordinance amendment with some changes that will bring um, the zoning ordinance amendment to the current, um, you know, make it as relevant as possible in in the times that we are because it is from 40 years ago i i appreciate that clarification Lee. i just want to clarify your clarification just to be clear our houses are basically split level there's a downstairs and those of ours those of us who have two level store two level mm -hmm. houses there's a downstairs and there's an upstairs and it's eminently possible within the proposed z mod to put a renter downstairs and to live upstairs without changing the structure of the house at all, you could easily make it what effectively is a duplex. Yes. Yeah. And, problem, and, and that's totally allowed by this proposed ZMOD. The trouble with that is now you take a small house with a lot of glass where we look out into nature and you double the volume of humans that are walking around and driving around. And I bet your bottom dollar within short, 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 short time, those houses are gonna push the envelope they're going to expand, they're going to get bigger. So too then will the proportion that is allowed as the accessory dwelling unit and the ripple effect and the domino effect of destroying this neighborhood is set into motion. So it's I, I, crazy I, enough to understand everything you're saying, but yeah. unfortunately, I, I think it is short-sighted. I'm not, I'm not attacking you, but ZMOD is incredibly myopic on trying to get more housing because yes you're right the first year my gosh you could suddenly house a bunch of people and boy do we need housing and i get that but there are so many better ways to do that planning ones that don't at the same time destroy single family neighborhoods which is effectively where we're heading with it as concerns a neighborhood like homes run acres it might not be the case even if yeah. But you're talking about homes that require nature in order for them to not feel claustrophobic. And the minute you start doubling the cars, doubling the humans, doubling mm -hmm. the traffic that's allowed because you're also allowing a business in each of those two, the accessory and the original one. And, you know, the, the minute you start adding all of that together, uh, the net result is, is effectively urbanizing what is now a single family residential uh, neighborhood. And I think that there are we need housing. Um, this is not the way to do it. So okay. I think, I think I, that's, I mean, that's one of the, 
was just going to add to that, Edith. I think that's one of the characteristics that needs to be, and I don't know that it can stop it. And I think that's the question right. we have. One of the characteristics yes. of Homes Run Acres is right. these are single residential houses. And I think the question is, is by putting that as a characteristic of the neighborhood and part of the guidelines, will that in fact stop that ZMOD from allowing multifamily dwelling in the neighborhood? So I think that's that's what we're trying yeah. to clarify. It's not multifamily dwelling, it's accessory dwelling, which is different from duplexes and triplexes and fourplexes. Um, the current zoning ordinance still allows accessory dwelling units. It just needs to be approved, uh, reviewed and approved by the Board of Zoning Appeals um, uh, through a, a special permit application. In addition, the current uh, zoning ordinance allows occupancy. For example, any single family residence can have one family and two roomers and boarders or four unrelated individuals can also occupy a single dwelling unit. So um, the the difference here is that a certain um, um, accessory dwelling unit that meets certain criteria could potentially be approved by right with a uh, with a um, administrative permit instead of having to go through the public hearing process before the Board of Zoning Appeals. But that's but a I huge think... difference because going from a special permit process to a by right process for anybody who isn't familiar with that means the difference between posting, allowing neighborhood input and going before the Board of Zoning Appeals before you can let a renter come in versus walking over to the county, signing a paper, writing a check and letting a renter come in. It's a huge okay. In process. Yeah, so I'm, I'm, I get, I'm gonna. Yeah, we're getting way I'm off. We'll down to this. I just. It. I think yeah. the net I net question you. is just. So it'd be great if we could bring some um, Zmod yes. people in, and, and I that's, really need to understand. But mm -hmm. also, without that, we need to understand what, what the. What is binding what, about these guidelines, I guess? Is yeah, well, again, the guidelines, again, aren't the binding part. So the zoning ordinance will be the regulatory part, and then the guidelines are what the ARB will use um, to work with the homeowner applicant to uh, permit whatever they're trying to build. So in addition, um, uh, changing their roof, um, adding uh, a new carport. Um, so again, what will happen in kind of what John Burns talked about a couple of meetings ago is if somebody wants to come in and they're putting on an addition that somehow is related to um, an, the affordable or a, a, what's it called again? I keep messing up affordable, not affordable dwelling unit, the accessory, attached, accessory dwelling unit. Yeah, sorry. Um, then they will have the ability to recommend approval for that permit or not recommend approval for that permit. So no, they can't stop it from the ARB is not the one that would be able to stop that from happening. But if if it doesn't fit the character of the neighborhood, then yes, they will likely not agree to let it go forward and they will ask them to come back with different designs. Um, but I think that we are again, we've kind of veered pretty far off topic. I think it's important. And so I will, like I said, I will go back and I'll talk to our ZMOD folks and see if they can come to our next meeting so that you guys can have the, the people that can answer these questions best. But I will also see for us what ways there are to incorporate um, this concern into the process moving forward. So um, whether the guidelines or as we've talked about and we've touched on like height and um, setbacks and stuff like that too. So it we're not going to we won't ignore this issue. We'll continue to talk about it. Um, and like I said, I think getting the ZMOD folks in will probably be the best way to to understand exactly how it could impact your neighborhood. So, um, so with that Nicole, said, yes. Can I ask a question here? Mm -hmm. yeah. <clears throat> yeah. This neighborhood cares really about only one thing, and that is scale. All the other things are niceties but they don't mean anything if we can't control scale and <clears throat> i was alarmed by what edith said is it true that we really have no way of controlling scale in terms of people building out to the minimum setback 
Well, no, and I think Lily can touch on this a little bit more, but if we, we can put into the zoning ordinance, correct, for for this HOD, if we decide it makes sense to, to minimize the setbacks so that you couldn't build out to what are the existing setbacks. Is that correct, Lily? Right. There is a potential to change the development standards and maybe provide a larger minimum setback, for example, to limit the scale uh, because that is something that would be included in the zoning ordinance rather than the design guideline. It's not something the ARB would be able to waive um, for any reason. If we were to include a, um, a, a larger minimum setback or a lower height, for example, to to limit the envelope and the scale, then um, any changes to that would probably require uh, a variance approval, uh, which has a, a much higher, um, you know, uh, or stricter findings that need to be made. Um, but the the we have tried for Holland Hills and for this one, we're looking at how we can limit scale and still protect the, pro, you know, proposed HOD with. Uh, language that would be put in the design guideline rather than the zoning ordinance. Um, anything we put in there could potentially basically um, down 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 zone the this specific section, this specific uh, subdivision. Whereas the other R three properties will probably be able to um, utilize what is included in the underlying zoning district. So um, we would need to look at it very carefully and make a nexus as to um, how that is the only way we can protect the um, um, the the subdivision as a whole by putting in additional. How, how, do about, how do we go about doing that? Because it seems to me that needs to be solved first before we get into all the other. Uh, details. Uh, I can't imagine that this neighborhood would support a 140 page gu guideline or <laughs> however long, large Holland Hills is. That just has so much detail in it that I just can't imagine we'd support all that detail. But the, we do want to, to deal with scale. Yeah. Yeah. So how how we would look at that is once we are done with identifying the contributing and non contributing structures and the character defining features of the HOD, um, it will be a discussion we will have in this work group as to what to limit or what to change. Um, for example, you could say, let's increase the um, minimum required setback. Um, what will be the appropriate setback and how would it impact the HOD as a whole? Not just positively, would it impact it negatively as well? So that's a discussion we need to have as a work group and, and go over what changes might need to be added in the HOD, in the, I'm sorry, in the zoning ordinance versus the design guideline and how do we support that? Don't deal with I mean, that. I know <laughs> Sorry, you guys both spoke over each other. Yeah. Why don't we deal with that first before we get into all of the other stuff? Well, that one's a little bit, I think, more complicated because we kind of need to understand what we're trying to do is understand. And I think we're getting there through these work group meetings is everything that's important. Um, and I understand your concern about all the details in the design guidelines, um, but those are important, too, because that will be more what if because I guess what I should say is that in Holland Hills, I think in there, there we've talked about, and I haven't been involved in the meetings lately, but they've talked about the setbacks and stuff. And we looked at, is there, is there a, a standard minimum setback that we could put in, but because the way the lots are shaped makes it really complicated. And so the design guidelines ended up being the way that they're heading with that. Um, and so we're trying to understand in this group too, with Holmes Run Acres, Obviously, we've talked about massing and scale a lot, but we were also talked about how we can different ways that we can do that. Because again, as Lily said, if we do put it in the zoning ordinance and it is a requirement, then that does affect how you all can add on to your homes too. 
like you probably don't have a plan to put on like a big giant addition that will overwhelm your home, but you might put on an addition. And if your home is on your lot in a way that there's only one place that you can put your addition and we've all of a sudden made your setback so incredibly small that you can't add on to it, that's going to be an issue too. So we're trying to get, we're trying to find out all the information that we can at the moment to, to have a better discussion about is it possible to put that is should we put that in the zoning ordinance is that something that will actually benefit will the benefits outweigh the negatives i guess is the point see i don't see why you have to do it by setbacks because these lots are too small to <clears throat> to, to make the setbacks uh larger i don't see why you can't do it by percentage mm -hmm. of lot that's used uh then then you don't have to worry about a setback issue and Lily, isn't that because we don't have that ability? We don't. We don't currently have percentage for um, residential dwellings in the zoning ordinance. Um, if we do add it for this subdivision, it would only be applicable to this subdivision, and I don't know how that will work. We will need to look at that. But in terms of percentage, that does not automatically take away the existing um, setback requirement. So it would be in addition to what the setback requirement would be for um, the this subdivision based on the underlying zoning um, um, district. It, it is our three zones on. Uh, requirement, for example, the front is 30, the side is 12 and the, on each side and the rear is 25 feet. So on top of that, I, are you maybe looking at putting a percentage of the buildable area? Um, that would be the footprint restrictive and and we will we will basically need to look at it and see if it how it would impact all of the properties uh, over um, how many properties do we have, Nicole? Um, we would need to look at that and see. <laughs> like, it's it's uniquely applicable to this um, uh, subdivision. Is it something that we would rather have in the design guidelines and make sure that? You know, any addition, for example, we can add languages that say any addition cannot, you know, um, overwhelm the properties on each side of of uh, the resource, especially if we found it to be a contributing structure versus putting a, a, a set number that will be very hard to change. So, so just that, let me, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm going to try to help. Okay. Help you close this, Nicole, so we can. Yeah. Well, because I have one more but, thing. Yeah, I'd like to <laughs> speak on. Yeah. I think I think, uh, I think Lily, you're being highly diplomatic. A lot of the things that you're talking about are actually would end us up in court if we did things incorrectly, and we can't afford to pay, you know, court fees and stuff like that. Um, but anyhow, um, I appreciate what you're saying, but I think at the end of the day, um, there's obviously a lot of learning that happens with zoning. I know that Edith is very familiar with zoning. I'm very familiar with zoning, what's legal, what isn't legal, what are takings and, you know, all, all these things. Um, but I appreciate what you've been, you know, providing as information. I would say my takeaway is, and if we can move on to the next part of the agenda is, we really have to prove that making homes run acres, a historic overlay district, is of more important value or more valuable to the county than other recommendations. I'll just put it that way. That's the businessman coming out in me, but I understand these things. It, it is financial and we have to figure that out. So whatever we would suggest has to generate a bigger base than any other forces that may be saying to us that the zoning needs to change. So if we provide that case and we come up with guidelines that make sense, that actually make this more valuable to the county, then the county will help us in staying off things like ZMOD and things like that. And that's just me being very pragmatic. And I just want to leave it at that, but we really need to show the value of the HOD. Um, yeah, so the last thing I will say, and then we will actually move on, um, is that part of the balance between 
what we can require, what we should require, and what we should recommend. Um, because obviously when we make something too restrictive, there's no way this HOD will pass and then you won't have any kind of help. Um, and I understand the, the worry about making it less restrictive because then you worry that things will go too far. But what, what I will say in my two years working with the ARB is that rarely does something go forward that the ARB is not okay with. So if something's coming in and it's a large massing building that does not fit with the character of the neighborhood, they will go back and again and again and say, this doesn't fit the character of the neighborhood. You know, we need it to look different. We need you to shift this. We need you to move this. So it's, it, it doesn't mean just because it's not in the zoning ordinance that they can't say no, they'll say, come back to us with a different design. And we've seen that happen multiple times. So, um, so don't assume just because it's a guideline that it's not going to be followed. Um, they still have to get through the ARB. Okay. I do have a quick suggestion. Sorry, I was trying not to argue, but I, I noticed that um, most overlay districts specify a maximum building height between 36 and 40 feet. The Lake Ann district uh, focuses on the intent and character of the district. And I realize that's partly because they have something like an 18 story building in the district. But I was wondering if rather than being too restrictive, we might want to have language similar to Lake Ann's where where there should be rather than presuming that anything at around 36 feet is okay maybe think about the siting of the particular houses next door perhaps some lots yeah. might some yeah. lots might allow for building higher than others perhaps sure okay Thank you. Um, I've added that to the notes to, to consider too. So thank you guys. I appreciate the discussion um, and definitely have some things for us to uh, continue working on and we'll get back to you about for before the next meeting. But um, I do wanna go on to the next part of the agenda. So we will look at some more of the houses, um, some that we are questioning their contributing, non-contributing status, and then some that are, um, we just wanna have a discussion item to get a better sense of uh, again, what works for the neighborhood design wise, um, structure wise, that kind of stuff. So Kira, um, will you pull up the spreadsheet and I will pull up the photos. Sure thing. Thank you. Can you hear screaming in the background? Is that, I heard somebody laugh. I've got um, <laughs> twin four and a half year old nephews right outside the door, so. <laughs> that was probably me laughing, Nicole. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I so, thought it was super cute. Yeah, they haven't come in yet, which is interesting. They were banging on the window. Oh, there's a dog in the house too, fun. All right. Um, okay, so let me share my screen again. Okay. All right, so we are at 3404 Cypress Drive. Um, Kira, can you give the description of the house and I'll pull up the permit too. Sure thing. The National Register description says that it has a sympathetic addition along the side elevation of the house and that the addition is a two-story frame gabled roof addition sheathed in vertical board on a concrete foundation. Okay, so and according to permits, the addition was put on in 1981. 1981. Okay. Um, so thoughts, I'm pulling up the permits too to just see if there's anything else. Um and let's see. So thoughts on this addition to start out. I can switch the other picture here. That's a good view of it. So obviously we have some concerns about the, the massing, kind of the large front addition. Um, what are your guys' thoughts on that? Now, I, for one, have no problem with it. I think it's still maintained, still contributes. 
Yeah, I think you can definitely still see the original home. Um, mm -hmm. I, the one thing that stands out to me is the, the I guess it's a balcony of sorts over. So like part of the roof is just flat, whereas part of it is sloped. I, that seems kind of weird to me, that, that kind of front foot that sticks out underneath the balcony. Gotcha. Um, I understand the massing issue. I don't know that this one is as extreme as some of the others we've seen. I, I mean, I feel like that would be, I feel like that's still contributing. Mm -hmm. the, the question would be like, would we want to approve that if it came through? I mean, it could definitely use some guidance, but mm -hmm. but I think it's contributing. I agree. I agree with that. The actual the roof line is probably the same as the rest of the roof line. You're just seeing it yeah. from the front. Um, mm -hmm. The only question I would have would be the the railing. I mean, it. I don't know. I don't want to get into sort of design issues, but um, I think it's still contributing. I think it's contributing. I think it's contributing. I might like to see the overhangs on the addition a little longer, but um, I think it's contributing. Good point. Okay. Right. It's in the spirit of the homes on acres houses. It's not, you know, just a what did he rip up? Attack on. No, I think that, okay. yeah. The one thing, in addition to the railing, it looks like there might be a sliding glass door on the second story. Mm. And there, I mean, I know I don't know how you do a deck without a sliding glass door, but it's not something I've seen in the acres before. I think that's sort of like the devil, devil in the details sort of thing. Like I, I think a lot of people in the neighborhood would have an issue if we started going guidelines of sliding glass doors versus opening doors. And I, I don't, I don't see sliding glass doors as, as detracting from the overall contributing factor of a, of a home to an acre home. Yeah, especially because it's still very much in the spirit of big windows. So. That doesn't, I think, I think Edith's point though about the overhangs, that's, that's a good point. I think that is one thing that's bothering me without me like being able to articulate it. Okay. It's a little stubby up there and I think that might be part of the reason why. Yeah, I don't think that you have to always adhere to the, you know, the long, over, there are times when yeah. you can do it without, but I think what it does do is it makes the, that kind of thin edge the a thin leading edge that is sort of characteristic of a lot of our houses it it aborts that a little bit it sort of it sort of makes it more blunt so it's it's a detail but i do think it 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 goes towards part of the reason why i think proportionally it feels narrow and tall and not yeah. horizontal yeah okay all right great um we will move on to the next one um which is 3410 um, so this one, and Kira, correct me if I'm wrong, um, but this one uh, actually was considered non-contributing in the National Register District. Um, that is correct. Okay. And we actually thought, it, I guess because of this addition, but we felt that it, you know, it was subservient to the, to the original house. Um, you know, you can basically see the original house, especially from that. Um, side view. So we actually felt that this might be one that we would actually change back to contributing. Um, but any thoughts on that from you guys? I think it's contributing. I don't understand why it wasn't considered contributing. Yeah, yeah. we didn't either. I, I, I agree. I think it's contributing. Um, I think it's attractive. I wonder if maybe someone saw the chimney and didn't like that. Uh, I'm not an architect, so I'll defer to others. But overall, I like the house. Yeah, and I think um, if I look at the permits too, I don't think there are any other major, there's no other changes. Um, Not since the National Register nomination. Yeah. So, yeah, I, yeah, I mean, to us, you know, it was a, a an addition on the one, one elevation. Um, again, you can see that it's an addition, so you know it's not part of the original structure, so you're not faking history, but it seems to, it seems to fit fine with the, the character of the neighborhood. Yeah. So, okay. Great, so we will agree on that one then. Okay, and then next one, 3318, one second. Okay, 
So this one's a little bit hard to see because um, it's fairly far back there. Yeah. Um, That's one of those additions that pops up in part of the house, but not the rest of it. Mm -hmm. It's at the back of the house and the windows on it also are not typical. Mm -hmm. That's a hard one. Because you can clearly like where where the addition is not, it would definitely be contributing, but with that addition on it, it's hard to say. Okay. Hey, um, I still think it's contributing. With maybe some de design issues that would have gone differently had it gone through an ARB, but I think you gotta sit and be quiet though. I got a lot of typing to do. Kira, you're um, unmuted. <laughs> Sorry. It's okay. Your dog? Yes. He <laughs> wanted to join. Yeah. So here I'll share. Um, okay. Uh, and so this is the. Oh, no, I forgot. Hold on. Sorry. Oh, there we go. Okay. Um, so this is the permit. So. Um, you can see there's the existing and then the, the proposed addition is is just off the rear. So it's um uh it's just that one addition. I think it's just also partly the perspective of of being so far back. I think maybe if you were able to get around the whole building, um, it might be a different a different feeling too. But I think I agree. Um, I was gonna say that when you see it from the angle that we just photographed it, you know, you nature first and you get addition second and it's mm -hmm. in the same color, but I mean, definitely the, the volume is, I think it could be handled. I mean, just very simply, if that had been a flat roof or a shallower pitch and no Palladian window, I think it would have gone a long ways in making it. Mm -hmm. My question is for the neighbor on the other side, you know, what happens at the end? when this went up, because it, it is a two story where there wasn't one before. So, um, you know, I think from the, from the perspective that the photograph is taken in, you know, you could argue that it's fine, but I, I don't know from the people from the other angle, I think that got, because it's pretty close to the, the rear or side yard setback. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Are we set this one's in question. I, I realized I was muted when I did that. Um, I sound like most everybody agrees it's probably contributing, although maybe it would be slightly different if it came through through an ARB process. Well, um, they, they, they changed the pitch of the roof, but uh, it doesn't jump out at you all that much. I mean, it's a lot steeper than, than the original house. Yeah, I, I guess this gets to the, the, the guideline question of in this particular case on this lot where you're really pretty far away from, you know, the flano, the walker kind of scene. And so when you're talking about a neighborhood um, registry and you're looking at kind of cohesiveness of the neighborhood, I think it just falls into play. But what happens if you then say, OK, this is contributing. And then the neighbor says, well, wait a minute. So now I'm going to do similar pitch and I'm going to put Palladian windows and I'm going to also bump up two stories. You know, how come this one was okay and mine isn't? So I think that's where I start having concerns. That's a good, yeah. I guess I, I, think it's, I, think I guess it's border, I'm not clear. It's kind of borderline. Go ahead, sorry. You say it's I kind was going to say, I, it, it's not clear to me what it means. Okay. So if we say something's non-contributing now, and we're, we're, we're using these as examples, um, and we're considering design styles, I mean, what is really the implication of us saying it's not contributing today? Um, that's why I kind of felt like it could be contributing, but if it had gone through an ARB, there would probably be some design recommendations rather than this. But but what, what are the implications of saying it's not contributing today? Um, I think it's just more, again, if 
obviously, if it's within the district, if it ends up being within the district, um, it still has to go to the ARB if it's non contributing. Um, and they would still have to. They'd have to meet the design guidelines in a similar way. It's, it would also depend on what houses are surrounding them. Um, it also, as we're going through this, if it ends up being that maybe there are sections, um, and I'm not saying that this is the case, but if there are like maybe there's a whole uh, cul-de-sac or a whole road or like five houses in a row that are all non-contributing, then we would talk about maybe they, they don't belong in the district. And so that would be probably one of the, the implications of it. Um, again, I don't. I don't think that's the case, but I think that's something that we have to consider. So. Are there any tax implications for your house being contributing or not? Um, there are um, some tax credit ability, um, uh, depending on federal income tax is only for income generating structures, um, but I believe the state income tax um, benefit is for homes. Up if you're making an addition of a certain amount. So yeah, if you were contributing, there may be some kind of um, tax benefit um, if you're doing um, a rehabilitation or an addition, something to that effect. I think the individual structure has to be on the uh, <clears throat> registry, not the neighborhood for that to happen. In other words, it, the, the structure itself has to be accepted as as yes, so that, that's what I'm saying. If it's contributing, yes, to a National Register Historic District. Um, so, okay. So, next one. I have two quick questions. First of all, uh, structures that are contributing in this district, but not in the National Register, would they have to be resubmitted if if those individuals wanted a rehabilitation credit, or would this supersede? I think you're, you're, yeah, you're sorry, muted. I realized that I, un I muted myself instead of unmuting myself. Um, it would, um, no. So if it was already considered non contributing to the National Register District and the state agreed with that, um, and the National Park Service, it would be unlikely that they could get back onto it. Um, it's a, usually it means it's already lost its integrity. Um, so no, our historic overlay district would not supersede that. Um, so no, and that you have two questions. Yes, my other was about the house. I was just looking from Google Street View mm -hmm. and um, it looks as though one house is two stories and then another house adjacent is one story and that on that side there are hardly any windows, unlike on the side that we see. Mm -hmm. And maybe that maybe that was done in consultation with the neighbor, um, but it does leave you kind of looking at a a very non HRA style side from the other house. Although if gotcha. a neighbor requested that, then who am I to argue? <laughs> True. Um, yeah, but no, that's interesting. Okay. Um, I'm like, someone contributing on this one, <laughs> but we can move on. Okay. <clears throat> Hmm. Did they increase the slope of the roof? Yes, they did. Yes, they did. <laughs> it's interesting. It's still modern for sure. And this is one of those ones that was a little bit difficult to see. So, yeah. Thoughts. Let me see if I can pull up the permit and that might help give us a little bit more perspective of what actually is happening. Nicole, I think we skipped over 3319 Elm Terrace. Oh, did we? Okay. Well, let's, since we're on 3322, we'll do that real quick and then we'll go back to that one. Sorry. Sounds good. I also had a cat join me in the room now, so it's been a. I understand. Okay, so. So this is showing. Um, so obviously the original structures in the middle here. Um, 
that carport exist? It's hard to. Was that the carport? I yeah, that's what I'm. I don't. I I don't think that carport is there. No, yeah. I don't think it is. It looks like it's something that's been permitted, but has not been constructed for whatever reason. So. I think you're right. I think it's yeah. it definitely is not there, but he calls it out as new. So um, I think there was an intent to maybe put it there. Yeah, I'll, I'll just say oh, okay. yes, they didn't. Yeah, that looks like that would be a tight fit in there. Um, okay, so. See the plant again. There you go. So it's a very strange addition. Sorry, one second. I agree with Adidas. There's an older permit, so I'm going to see if that has maybe a little bit more information about that addition on the front. So, no. So it looks like that was that was the original. <coughs> Hmm. All right. Um, I need one second. I'll be right back. Um, it's funny because they want space to go out back, and it looks like they did build out back on the permit. There was a big yellow area on the permit out back, and I wonder, like, what did they do on the front? I can't really tell. They pushed out the front. You can see the part on the photograph. You can see. Um, Did they just? But it looks like just a short little, almost like a foyer. Like they added a foyer sort of thing. Yeah, probably a little bit more than that. But yes, they they just did a small front. That's what it appears to be. Don't let monkey in. Nicole, can you go back to the permit? Yes. That one there. Yeah, but see, Edith, look, there's like already that 12.6 foot. There's that's all appears to be so there must have been like multiple. Correct. The first the, the last picture we did the last image we just saw was of the original house, and then the dashed in area was the optional carport. Arvidas or Keith might be able to tell me whether there had ever been a carport on that. But clearly when this permit was pulled with the bright yellow, um, the 12 foot six little bump. That you see there it was already existing, so they engulfed mm -hmm. it with something a little bit bigger, and then they added another thing in the back and put a shed roof on it, and uh, luckily didn't build the carport. <laughs> it's hard to judge this without seeing the back, and you can't see anything over. You can see anything from the in the back. That big yellow uh, part is not visible in the picture. Yeah. I mean, it's the teeny little bit of it. Yeah. <laughs> If you look, is is it two stories though? Because I see in the photo there's like a little bit. Um, if you go back to that, yeah, you see. Oh no, wait. Actually, that yeah. looks like some kind of vent. That's not two stories. It's just a higher. Yeah. yeah. It's just taller. Yeah. It's taller. It's just he's taking. So Wade did this addition. Um, he's taking the the eave line. You can see behind the bushes to the right. That's the original house, right? It's a tar and gravel roof. Mm -hmm. right. Your eye all the way around to the left side of the bump out in the front. It kind of roughly hits the same datum, the same elevation, and then he just he just ski jumped up from there. So and put in a new chimney mass to try to, you know, mm -hmm. it it's it's a bit it's a bit odd. Can't say. Anything. Yeah, I think um this one what we'll probably recommend for now is um getting permission to get pictures from all the sides um to get a better sense of it um so i think that would probably help i think it's hard with the vegetation um to understand exactly how much this affects the whole structure what is that what is that roof line at is that a 312 412 it's hard to say, I mean, from this angle, because we're also looking at it from underneath, but yeah, it's definitely more than, a, I think it's, you know, we're a one and a half, a two and 12. I think this is a little bit more than that. It's a lot more, you know, you know what people try to do generally? Uh, they try to be able to use shingles and that's why they go to like a four and 12. Uh, right. 
pitch. Right. Uh, because you have what, to be over a 312 or higher for shingles. I mean, I there don't, are shingles that are approved for lower pitches, but they're very tricky and, and nobody wants right. to use them. I think we've, we've talked about this before. I don't think that I don't. I would say like a 612 is probably not contributing. I'm not sure that this I, I have a problem with roof lines. I think everybody's heard me say this before. We have to be very careful on roof lines, but I agree like a 612 is not, you know, contributing, you know, but. Is this bothersome to me in the neighborhood? The answer is no. I just don't know if we want to set a guideline for what the pitch of the roof is. Uh, but I understand why people are going to higher pitch roofs. I mean, I have no intentions when I finally have to replace my my roof of going with a gravel roof again. So if that forces me someplace else, I think that other people should have that. But I'm also not put, planning on putting in a Swiss chalet roof yeah, and not on my house either. Yeah, Patrick, I don't think you have to um, do tar and gravel. I don't think anybody in the acres has to do tar and gravel. I think that's a choice at this point, regardless of the slope that you use. There are plenty of materials out there that can that can roof your house. I think that the I, I think just having worked with Wade before and having challenged him on something like this before on an addition that we worked together on, I think what's going on here instead is he wanted the volume. Um, the width of this addition is wider than, you know, half of one of our houses. So when you take, even if you take right. the existing same slope, if you're just going in one direction and you don't return it with a ridge and you don't clip it back and come back slope, come back down on the slope from the other side of a ridge, you're going to end up with a speed jump. There are a couple of houses that, you know, that have that. Um, it's oh, well, no, he, just put, he, just put, he just put one on next to the house next to me. Yeah, that I mean it's a lot less with no features, and it's, a lot uh, less expensive. Yeah. But I don't introducing a ridge, so I think you're just at the limits of this, and I agree. I mean, I think you're still at a shallow slope. You still are nominally look. This isn't a neo-colonial addition, so I think in that regard, it still kind of fits in. But it does, to my eye, just having walked past it many times, it does feel rather large for the scale of the existing house that it's tucked behind it. I think it's marginal, but I, it's not. It's it's not totally bad. I agree completely. It's probably at the at the level where we would say would would not want to see it exceed this in our guidelines. <laughs> that would be an example yeah, yeah. of maximizing, maximizing, and don't go further than this. I think that's kind of where I fell at because, like I said. My my neighbor's house is a is a gaddy also, and mm -hmm. it now has a very different front to it, thanks mm -hmm. to Wade. And you go, I love it. It's beautiful. Looks great. Doesn't bother me. But some people might say it's no longer contributing. But I don't believe that. But there are other reasons why it's not contributing in my mind. But for the most part, it's the roof line doesn't bother me in this house. I think the chimney mass is a little bit. I think. You know, like the, I think the chimney would have looked a little bit more um, modern had they kept a like a pipe instead of a, a, a slim chimney, a slim wrapped brick chimney mass. It's, you know, the chimney masses are a big portion of our homes and homes run acres and a big portion of mid century modern homes. And they're usually large, they're large volumes. They, they, they are, you know, half of a wall kind of thing. And this, this just pops up. It's a little bit. It, it you're an architect. Mention. I know. I can tell you're I an architect. I, I have to bite my tongue because I, I do think that. <laughs> I, I, it didn't even occur to me. I'm like, nope, got a chimney. Looks just like the other chimney. Do you feel, but, do you feel yeah, like it's. I, I understand you what you're saying. Yeah. I understand what you're saying, but that, that takes a, like a very precise eye to look at that. <laughs> Yeah, my, my reaction, my reaction to this kind of thing is, hey, I don't want to stop people from building things like this. <laughs> it's okay. It, it's certainly not so uh, out of proportion that we need to worry about it. I like to see I, people I, be I creative, agree. solve problems. Yeah, 
that's why I didn't actually say anything. I mean, I'd much rather see this than a neo-colonial house or the thing that's up on Sycamore. So I I have to sort of step back a bit. But I think, again, this is some of that conversation that kind of gets us more at the kind of like the the details that we will get that will end up hopefully in the design guidelines again. So kind of I think what Patrick was saying is like, you know, maybe there's a there's a specific it's steep uh, the pitch of the roof that we can maybe recommend not going above. So, um, but um, the purpose of design guidelines, I think this discussion has been good. As for whether it's contributing or non contributing, I would withhold judgment till I've seen more of it. Yeah, so um, that's one of the things we did with Holland Hills. Um, there was a number of houses that you couldn't see anything from the road or you could just see this one little thing. And so, um, especially with a structure like this, where they only have the one addition on, um, I wanna see the whole house before we make a decision. Because I think, you know, based on this conversation and what we know, it, it probably is still contributing, but it would be better to have a whole view of it so we can say, hey, yeah, this is why I look at it. Most of the most of the structure is still there. It's still intact. You can see it. This is just the only part that you can't see because just because of the angle from the road and the, the vegetation. Mm-hmm. I keep offering. I keep offering my house. Come on over, take some pictures. I didn't do anything drastic. I did one thing, and I'm curious to whatever everybody thinks about it. But well, we can definitely <laughs> put you on the the chopping block. Three, three, three four zero oh, three Sherwood. All right. I'll, I'll let you okay. take all kinds of pictures. We'll move on to the next one. So I skipped thirty three nineteen on accident. So we're gonna go there next. Um, should pop up in a second. There you go. Oh, that's um, cool. Yeah. So, and that's the other view. I think we just have, yeah, just the two views. So, um, and then I could pull up the permit too while you kind of glance at that. See, they popped up on only part of the house, but it looks natural. Okay. I agree. I mean, I think, you know, the, the, the architectural strategies for that are, you know, breaking the massing down and changing which side of the roof you look at here we're looking at the eave which gives you the long horizontal instead of the side which gives you the gable or the the giant ski slope so i just think it it achieved the same result but it was on the back of the house not the front and you get led up to it um and you know just the way it it sits in the landscape changes your perception of that height a little bit so those you know that's again one of these things that makes it difficult to codify how how do you encourage this as opposed to the previous one but i think both are contributing i think this is very contributing yes contributing i have no problem with it at all the the moving pod though it's got to go i mean i don't i don't know what they're thinking (laughs) you don't want to have that be part of it (laughs) it's gone it's gone (laughs) exactly is that is that an addition is that like you know (laughs) (laughs) that everybody is a dwarf weeping cherry tree right there in front of us no oh go jenny yay (laughs) that's one of them i want one all right, so that it's sounds not, like everybody. It's not, a, it's not. A, it's not a weeper. It's not a weeper, by the way. No, it is. It, okay, well, we'll take it offline. Oh. <laughs> it's not a weeper. And Nancy also agrees that she thinks it's definitely contributing. So, okay, great. Yeah, um, we all agree. Oh, it's <laughs> fine. It is fine. Muted myself again. Okay, so next we're going to jump. Um, we're jumping around a little bit today, um, just based on what I got to this week. So um, we're going to jump to 3313 Executive Avenue. I think I know which one that is. Okay. I don't know. Is that Mitch's house? And got a couple different views. That's Mitch's house, but the, you need the front view to really see it. Yeah. 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 How, there you go. Yeah. Totally contributor. Yeah. yeah. That's interesting. It's Cypress sighting. It's the only Sorry. people I think that have used Cypress. Oh, it's okay. fine. I'm true confession, and I can tell you anything you want to know because I'm the architect for this one. <laughs> All right. 
beautiful. Thank you. It's not contributing. It's not contributing. <laughs> <laughs> Even you eat it. <laughs> no, it is. It's it's different. Like you can you can tell obviously that's a renovation and not just because of the wood siding. But Edith, is the slope the roof is doing like interesting things here? Is it even lower slope than it normally is? No, <clears throat> no. We went with a flat roof. Um, you can see the chimney pot over the entrance. Um, which incidentally, there's there was meant to be a walkway that started kind of where the grass and the flower bed in the front, there's sort of a, a, a demarcation where the grass starts, but um, for budgetary reasons, they ran out, they didn't do that. So they now enter through the carport, but um, no, it's a flat roof. And I just, I just changed, um, you know, I didn't keep the flat roof continuous from the bump out over the, the entrance um, porch. I set that back a little bit. I made sure I reintroduced a column that was thin. So you kind of got that crisp thin line and then reintroduced um, the carport. That's not the original carport, but it shares you know, obviously the same dimensions and aesthetic as the original carport. So added that on and actually it was important to me as you came down executive, but also as you went up executive that it sort of unfolded naturally you, ne you never got a dumb side because i think that's one of the things that happens with additions sometimes we focus on <laughs> so i'm gonna have to remember that term now i know what to call them the dumb side Beautiful so you can see in the front a horrible siding on the sides and back the dumb side yeah. so so and then just played some tricks with windows you can see how the window comes all the way up to the roof line on what is the office slash bedroom addition but then in the main volume you know there's more siding above it and incidentally the siding that we added on they they had cypress the people that they bought the house from had just resided before they sold it, um with a, a oh bless you with um and then i ended up doing a butt joint and so it's not an it's not a lap joint so if you got up super close it would be a much cleaner more modern use of the siding so that's an that's a you know, still looks like it's lap. It still looks like what you expect, but you're not going to, it's not a lap siding. It's actually a butt. So it's a miter joint at the corners. And then the, the boards are, um, flush. They don't overlap. So it's just a slightly more modern use of the same material. So as a woodworker, I love the fact that it's a miter joint at the corners. <laughs> I really I know, like that. <laughs> I'm, like, really? <laughs> I'm like, really? Minor joint. I'm like, okay, you got my attention. <laughs> that just means there's no overlap, Patrick. It's just a real crisp edge. Exactly. No, I know what it looks like. Oh, okay. <laughs> Professional finished look. Yeah, no, I know what a minor joint is. Edith, what did this house look like before it was renovated? I mean, it looks extensively and very nicely renovated. I just don't know what the original house looked like. You can see part of it poking out to the very right. So the slope of the carport is answered by the slope of the existing house to the very right. Okay. Um, step back. And if you look at the house, if you're walking by the executive and you look at the house immediately to the left of this house, that's what this house looked like. There was there was a carport on the side. There were the, the dining room window and then the large wide chimney mass. And then a living room window. And that's it. And then it was just a box going straight back to the park. Yeah, I think that was our question because um, there aren't any permits on file except for the original house. So we couldn't exactly tell um, from because when we went around to the park side, we could definitely see the original house coming straight back. But from here, it like we thought that was the, the original roof line back there, but we couldn't tell what exactly had happened. Um, so. Should have to be permits on file because I know I filed them, but <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> they may not have been. I don't know. Well, they would have been electronic, so I don't know why they're. Maybe they just haven't updated them yet. Um, no, so I, you know, I think this this is actually another good point maybe to bring up, which is that because of the siting of these houses, maybe not so much along Hemlock where it had been a dairy farm, and so the houses it was flat and the houses were were able to be set one right after the other, but certainly when you get around executive and then up 
to the other side of the neighborhood, the houses started to turn a little bit and get shifted on the lots to accommodate the, the topography. And what that ends up doing is you don't always end up with the kitchen on one side and the bedroom on the other. Sometimes it's reversed. So when a client comes to you and asks for a specific program need, and that program need is on the front of the house, it changes the way you need to to address that than if say, you know, if, if for example, if they had asked um, for a bedroom wing only on the back of the house, it would have been a little bit easier to just extrude the back of the house, but this needed to do a little bit more to break down the massing a little bit. So, um, but yeah, so it's, it's effectively, again, if you, if you see the corner, you can see a little bit of a gutter going to a downspout um, on the far right behind the column that I introduced at the front entrance porch where the two um, chairs are. Beyond that, that's the portion of the existing former front of the house. Mm -hmm. so this, this, this one does pose, and, and I'm not picking on you, either, but this Take does pose an interesting. <laughs> now, this poses an interesting question because this is, in my mind, a, a largely remake completely. Um, so, it fits the design characteristics of the house, and it's very well built, and it's a, it's a, it's a beautiful implementation. But we've spent a lot of weeks talking about, does it look like a homes run acres house? And so I'm just posing that question out there to say, is this just a beautiful house and we like the lines and everything, or is it really in keeping with homes run acres? And I'm playing devil's advocate. I'll admit that I, I do that once in a while. I, I think that's a legitimate so, point because and for other comment for other houses like this, we have commented that the, the bricks at the bottom are gone. Right? So that the right, materials right. are different. To me, and it's probably just the angle we're looking at it, the, the roof slope looks, but Edith says it's not. The chimney has definitely changed substantially, right? So, like, there, there are definitely things that, the like, features of Homes Run Acres Homes that now feel like they're missing. <clears throat> um, I think to look, look at the house the next time you walk, and you'll notice the chimney is definitely still there. Um, and then I think to your point about the brick base, this one doesn't have one because it's a single story slab on grade. So there is no foundation. So I think we have to be careful about when we talk about the kit of parts of a Homes or an Acres home, because I think there are, there are different permutations based on how it sits on the site. But I, I, I understand the spirit of the question, which is, it's difficult. It's difficult to look at something you like and say, nope, we can't do it. Um, it begs the question, what's allowed? And I guess what what the way I've handled the, the additions that I've done in the neighborhood is that um, these houses were built as starter homes. There was every intent for them to be added on to and changed. And I think it does come down to how do you handle the kit of parts and what how do you respect what came before it, you know, so um, I think if you if you're walking down executive towards this house, I you will see you will see the original house before you really pay attention to the addition. And likewise, so, coming yeah, up. Yeah, so I, I, I mean, I definitely agree with that. I just like said, I, I I was playing it as devil's advocate. I don't think it's devil's I think advocate. It's a, I think, it, uh, no, Patrick, it's I think it's a legitimate quest. It's a legitimate comment we've had it on a couple of houses where we've right. said Boy, you know like stan dark's house <laughs> you know, right. like Stan's house is a perfect example i think i think it's it it's d guidelines are difficult you know i mean i've said this before i i wrote guidelines once for a big neighborhood in dc and I, my colleague and i sat down and wrote them and then we said okay you know what we have to design the ugliest damn house we can that fits within these guidelines. And we both came up with something atrocious. And yet they were guidelines that were meant to really prohibit right. atrocious things. I think it's very difficult to preclude, you know, because, well, anyway, yeah, people can get subjected. Well, it's, it's, definitely, yeah. it's, definitely, it's definitely in keeping with the, the neighborhood and everything from that perspective and all. And, 
And there's a, there's a house, uh, I won't disclose whose it is, but there's a house in the neighborhood that burned down and when it was, when it was rebuilt, mm-hmm. actually looks like it fits in the neighborhood and belongs to the neighborhood. But if you were to like go to the nth degree of looking at it, you would say it's non-conforming. And, but it definitely looks like it belongs in the neighborhood and yet it burned down and it was rebuilt and it was not built the same way as these. So, yeah, it's just kind of kind of interesting. Edith, are you saying that there was there was originally not a brick base on this house like most of them have? Um, take a look at the there's a tiny one. Take a look at the um, most of the single story houses. Here's the uh, back side of it. Right. So, okay. okay. The back side, you can see the slope slopes down towards the park. Yeah, so you're going to get a brick base, but you go around to the front. I didn't. I didn't bring the grade up to meet a flat, you know, to meet so that I wouldn't have to do base. I mean, that's, that is the existing grade. I so see. That's, you know, that's where you, so some houses are further out of the ground than other houses. You so know. the conversation this reminds me of that I think we had in the very first meeting was, are we trying to stick to mid-century modern or are we okay with modern? Or is there something like specially Holmes Ryan Acres that like, and I think that kind of, this raises those questions. In any case, like, I feel like it's contributing. If that's to sum it up. Yeah. Okay. I think that's what most people said. Um, but yeah, I think as we get a little bit further into this, um, and that is one of the biggest questions that you guys have all had is how specific to homes run acres. Um, does it have to be? And I think, you know, again, looking at the design guidelines. For Holland Hills, you know, a lot of it is kind of more more mid-century. But I think if you're going to the ARB, they're going to be, and Elise and Samantha can chime in too, like they're going to be more focused on definitely the mid-century part of it, but they're going to be looking at the specifics um, to homes or acres too. So, um, but again, it'll be a discussion. Um, Okay, it is five, or sorry, uh, 8.33. Um, So, I'm going to say, since we're already running a little bit over and I want to talk about our next meeting, um, we'll end it here. Um, and I'll just say real quick, um, we'll follow up. Like I said, I'll follow up with ZMOD. I'll talk to our ZMOD folks. And then I'll also kind of do Lily and I'll talk to Lily. Uh, and uh, we'll do some research into ways that we can talk further about um, how to deal with scale and massing um, for homes or acres. Because obviously that is uh, probably one of the biggest concerns that you all have. Um, so let me stop sharing my screen. Um, so let's talk about schedules. Uh, if we go again, kind of the same time period uh, for January, um, I think it would be, let's see, the 13th or the, oh, the 20th is inauguration day. And I guess I have the day off, so <laughs> just saw that, wow. Um, would the Wednesday the 13th work for everybody for the most part? The Wednesday, you said? Mm-hmm. Same, yeah, same that days should, of yeah. the week at 6.30. That yeah. should work. Yep, so, that should work. Okay. That works. Yep. Well, that, for okay. that is the day before the ARB meeting. Yeah, I figure that. Um, I'm just not sure, like, if we do it on inauguration day, if that's... Um, is it possible to do it the week before? That is the sixth that, or something. That would be a it's little tight. History commission. Yeah. yeah. So our history commissioners. Um, we could potentially put it back to the twenty seventh. I vote for twenty seventh. Twenty seventh. Give us a break. Okay. Any yeah. of those times oh, yeah, are fine first, by me. Okay. First week um, in January is a bit difficult. So yeah, I, okay. I agree. Pushing okay, back. so let's um. Week. Yeah, well, why don't everybody pencil it in for January 27th? Um, so it's a Wednesday at 6.30. Um, and I will see about hopefully getting the Z-Monk folks to come. And then also, um, hopefully, we will have um, our contractors for the design guidelines be able to come and um, give a, maybe a little presentation and just kind of get a sense of. Um, and we've been, like I said, we've been collecting all your concerns about um, the issues. And so we'll be. Working. We'll be meeting with them as soon as we get them on board and um, starting to relay those concerns and 
what you guys want to see uh, in the design guidelines. So hopefully they'll have a, a head start when they meet up with you. And tomorrow I will send you a link for the draft Holland Hill design guidelines. So that way you'll have a good month or six, five weeks to, to go through them and and see what see what makes sense to you, see what doesn't make sense to you and what things maybe that we can change uh, for Holmes Run Acres. So um, again, thank you guys all for your Nicole. time. Yes. Uh, yeah, just real quickly. Do we have like a sort of a, a grand milestone schedule of how long this, you know what how this is all going to phase out yes so that is actually what i'm going to be working on the next couple of weeks um i was waiting to see okay. when we got our design guideline contractors on board because you know depending on when we got them on and how long they were proposing to take that would affect when we can go forward to like planning commission and board of supervisors and all that so now that i've got them on board okay. um which just happened late last week um i'm going to work on hammering out a more uh, specific schedule. Um, and so hopefully we can talk about that then too. So we can see, yeah, the milestones when our staff report needs to be done, when the design guidelines need to be done, when we will be going right. to um, all the different kind of meetings. And we'll have to have another community meeting too. Um, okay. Because we need to yeah, make sure maybe, that maybe by, maybe by February, maybe by the February meeting, we can have something with that level of detail, which would yeah. be helpful. Yeah, for sure. Great. Thank you. Thank yeah. you very much. I appreciate Thank you guys. It. Yeah, I appreciate your time and the conversations. And um, yeah, now everyone have a very happy and safe holidays. Um, and uh, we will see you all in January. Thank but, you. Bye. Right, thank you guys. Happy holidays. Bye. 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 Who's the contractor? Uh, it's uh, Traceries. So thank it's you. the contractor that's doing all the overall design guidelines. So, okay. Thank mm -hmm. you.